Thanks for listening to our online messages from Calvary Chapel North Shore on the island of Kauai. Stay up to date on content and our events on our website, calvarychapelnorthshore.com and on Instagram at CCNS Kauai. If you'd like to donate to our ministry, you can do so on our website. Now let's dive into the Word. Um, we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 6, finishing 1 Timothy. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. The ushers will get you one. Just keep your hand up. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And while you're turning there, just to let you guys know, um, there's going to be a baptism today. Uh, kind of last minute, but we're going to do a baptism down at Black Pot, right at Honolulu Pier. So you're welcome to come down, get baptized, or uh, even maybe you're, you want to rededicate yourself. I think we need one right here. Bible? Oh, no. You just seen you like, all right, I'm with you. Um, even if you want to rededicate, sometimes uh, you, you feel like all of a sudden there's a breakthrough in your walk with God. And I don't know about you, but I, I've, every time I've been in Israel, I got baptized again. I rededicated my life because it's just, I don't know, you, you just can't walk away from the Jordan without getting in there. It's so good, you know, and just to thank the Lord for what He's doing because we should be growing every day. We should be growing in our walk with Jesus. We shouldn't be like we used to be. We should be changing. And so with that comes praise and just uh, thankfulness to God uh, for what He's doing in each and every one of your lives. And I love seeing what God's doing in this church's lives. I mean, just watching you guys grow, watching you get involved, people stepping up to the plate, and uh, it's an awesome thing. So we're going to do a baptism at Black Pot right by Hanalei Pier at 1230. Uh, you're welcome to come. There's going to be a lot of food and everything. So uh, if you want to bring something, you can, but you don't have to. But that should be a lot of fun. So we are in... First Timothy, we're going to finish the book today. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses 11 through 21. I've entitled the message, Fight the Good Fight. So important uh, in these last days. Amen? I mean, I'll tell you what, if you turn on the news, you can get really depressed. And you can open up your Bible and you can really rejoice. Uh, it's all a matter of keeping your eyes on the vertical instead of the horizon. Because if you keep your eyes on this world, you'll get discouraged. And many times we get so caught up in the things of the world that we stop fighting the good fight and we start getting pulled into the things of the world and then we're not getting a victory in our life through Jesus Christ because we become more concerned with the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches that it chokes out the fruit in our life. And God says in the midst of this storm, you keep your eyes on me. You keep your eyes on the vertical. If I keep my eyes on the vertical, guess what? The horizontal will work itself out. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And how quickly when times are tough and we're in, a, in the midst of tribulation can we get our eyes on things and forget to seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. We can't get that backwards. If you're in a storm today, get on your knees, Cry out to the one that can conquer the storm. He wants to be there for you. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's the great I am. He's the, the alpha, the omega, the beginning, the end, the first and the last. And he wants to do an amazing work in your life. And all you got to do is submit yourself to him. Just humble yourself in his sight. Pick up your cross. Follow after him. There's no better person to serve than the Lord Jesus Christ. He's God. He's the creator. He's our eternal life. He's the only one that can grant immortality. He's the only one that can save. He's the only one that forgives sins. And that we should be grateful. That should just psych you out so much. You're like, you know what? I am all in for Jesus. And I know many of us, including myself, have failed over the years. Um, but He's so gracious and full of love and mercy that he forgives me, he stands me up, he dusts me off, and he says, let's get back in the game. Praise the Lord for that, amen? amen. You know, I know the enemy will whisper in your ears, you're a loser and everything, and you know what? He's right, I am a loser, and I'm not, you know, worthy, and, and, but God just sees me as a, a prized jewel, a gem, a, a something wonderful and beautiful that he died for, and, and he wants every one of us with him 
for all eternity. And that is an amazing thing. Get your head around that. Are you kidding me? That God that created everything came down to die for you. And if it was only you, he would have done it for only you. And I think sometimes because grace is, is, a, is a giving thing, it's a loving thing, and salvation is free, that we take it for granted. And we find ourselves dabbling in the world and making mistakes and just kind of going, well, God knows my heart. Yes, he does. But he wants you to turn away from the things of the world and, and embrace the things of the kingdom and embrace him and to be ambassadors for Christ. Man, when you go out these doors in a little bit, you got to shine. You got to shine. God's got divine appointments for every one of you. And you're a reflection of Jesus Christ. You're the hands and feet of Jesus. You've got to fight the good fight. And it, it doesn't come without a fight. Especially now. Every Christian's under fire right now. They're, they're, I, just, I just saw the news yesterday. They're trying to ban Bibles in California. Oh, yeah, and you know how it is, guys. Don't go, oh, that's California. Yeah, I know, it's coming here. It won't be long. Be careful. Watch. Be ready. He's coming at an hour that you know not. And he's coming for his bride. But meanwhile, guess what? We have an awesome opportunity to serve him. To get in the game. Not just to come here on Sundays and go, praise the Lord, hallelujah, that's awesome. This is where we get equipped only though, so you can go out and do something. And I pray that you would do something. Because God wants to use you. You say, well, you, I, I, what can I do? You can do a lot through him. He's the one that gives you the power. He's the one that saved you. He's the one that gives you the gifts of the Spirit. He's the one that sets up, sets up the divine appointments. He's the one that does the work through you. And then he rewards you for what he did. There's nothing better. So I say, fight the good fight. Why don't got any moves? Just get out there. He'll take care of the rest. Just step into the arena. Just get in the zone. Remember when he called Philip? Philip was in Samaria. The, the church was thriving. I mean, they were probably planning on, you know, building a giant sanctuary, a coffee shop, all this stuff. And God says, go to the desert for one guy. I'll tell you what. You got a boom in church with thousands. And God says, walk away from it for one guy. You'd be kind of like, are you, are, you, are you sure, Lord? But he responded and he went there for one guy. He went for one guy because one guy was important. He was willing to be used by God in any capacity. He was willing to get in the game. And God wants you to get in the game. And all through this letter has been a letter of encouragement all through 1 Timothy and just, you know, encouraging Timothy to stand strong for truth. You and I need to stand strong for truth. We live in a world of lies. We live in a world that, that comes against what we believe. We, we live in a world that comes against truth and embraces evil. And you need to stand up. You got people that will get in your face. They don't have any problem talking evil around you or telling you what they believe. And, and sometimes as Christians, we cower. Stop cowering. Boldly proclaim your faith. And do not be ashamed. Because you know why? That person that has the vile mouth in front of you and is spewing all the junk, they need Jesus. And God wants to use you. We want to see people get saved. So fight the fight. Fight the good fight. Let God use you. Let Him empower you. Don't worry. He's got a hedge of protection around you. You'll be all right. What's the worst thing that can happen to you? You die and go straight to heaven? Wow, bummer. Right? I don't think any of us are afraid of dying as Christians. I think we're just more afraid how we die, right? And sometimes we say, you know, that, that, that poor young man, he was so young, God was using him so great, he died at an early age. You know what? God just wanted him home. That's what we've got to get in our hearts. We've got to figure that part out. Whether you live to be young or old, you're in Christ Jesus, God takes you home. It's because he wanted you home. It's because you fulfilled your calling. And maybe if you don't like this world and you're tired of this world, finish your calling. 
Maybe that's all it takes to get you to go home. You know what I mean? Just finish it up and boom, drop dead and go. Right? Every one of us is called. Timothy was called. Timothy, Paul had to encourage him in this letter. He says, listen, don't anybody despise you because of your youth. Amen? You hear me that, young people, teenagers? People in their 20s, just pretty much anybody younger than me? <laughs> Don't let anybody despise you because of your youth. You know why? Guess what? You got the same Holy Spirit I got. Amen. What's that mean? God can use a nine-year-old to put me in my place. Yeah, we're not going to accept that, right? A nine-year-old just rebuke you with the Word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. You're like, who are you? But that's how powerful our God is. And I love it when I see God working in our nine-year-olds. And they just say these just profound things come out of their mouth, and it's all about Jesus. When I see our teenagers serving and, and kind of sometimes putting adults to shame because they got more zeal for God than some of the older people. I just love seeing God working. And so Paul had to encourage Timothy, don't let anyone despise you because of your youth. He told him, make sure that you teach sound doctrine. He, he shares in here, don't allow phony doctrine. Stay away from vain babblings and idle talk and false doctrines and, and, and these legalists he was warning against. He goes, don't even get caught up with people that always want to argue. You know, you know what they're like. You get in with these people and all they want to do is argue all the time. They never have anything good to say. They never have anything positive to say. They're not out there sharing the love of God. They're not out there giving the gospel. They're just straightening everybody out. And God says, stay away from those guys. They'll bring you down. Stay on track. Fight the good fight. And then he shares with us about being in ministry. And everyone here should be in ministry. I'm not trying to put a guilt trip or anything like that, but you know what? We're here to serve God. Everybody should be in ministry. God called you. Every one of you has a calling. As soon as you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you got called. And so he gives us great instructions for being leaders in the church here. How to be what a pastor should be like, what an elder should be like, what a deacon should be like, what the congregation should be like, how we should serve. And then, and then he talks to us about how we should be treating our leaders in our church. Very important that as leaders that are appointed by Jesus to serve in a church, that we are to honor those leaders in such a way to where when someone spreads like gossip, we don't, we, don't, we don't acknowledge it. He says, you know, if anybody talks about your pastors, your elders, your, your deacons, uh, you stop them right there and you say, hey, do you got two or three witnesses? And if they say, no, I just heard it from a reputable source, you say, no, dismiss that. I don't want to hear it. Because the enemy will do anything he can to split a church. And how many churches I've seen split because somebody spread lies and gossips and people believed it without even searching out the facts to see if there was any witnesses or any truth behind it. And the enemy got a victory. And so he warns us against that stuff. Protect your family. We're linking arms and arms. Somebody comes to me and talks to me about you. I'm going to say, wait a minute, stop right there. Can I quote you on that? Oh, well, no, Pastor. I just thought you should know. I go, oh, then I don't want to hear it. You got witnesses on that? Stop right there. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear garbage about you that's not true just because somebody might have an attitude towards you. We need to do things by the book, according to the Word of God. That's how we're supposed to run our lives. And that's important for us to do. So he not only tells us how we're to treat our leaders in a church, but he tells us how we're to treat each other in the congregation, how we're supposed to love each other and serve alongside each other and be there, iron sharpening iron, encouraging one another. We're all going to make mistakes, but to come alongside each other and say, man, I love you. I'm there for you. Let's do this together. God wants to do great things through you. And then he encouraged us about uh, how we're to treat people outside of church, the unbelievers. There's your challenge. I hear people come, you know, and tell me, oh, you know, we're trying to share the love of God with around these people. They were just cursing and saying the F-bomb and all this and everything. And I go, what would you expect? What, did you think they were going to be all cleaned up and everything? You're, you're down, throw the net, catch the fish, let God clean them. So he teaches us how we are to treat people outside of the church, and then he talked to us about money. Ooh, man, I had to go to that. You know we're supposed to give, right? I don't like to talk about money, but I have to when I come to it in the Bible. 
And uh, as believers, we're called to give. And um, we're supposed to send it ahead because you can't take anything with you, can you? You know, you, you see all these people that are just like, you know, billionaires and tycoons. And, you know, none of that's going to do them any good when they're on their deathbed. If they, if they don't have Jesus, they're goners. All the money in the world is not going to save them when they're about to die. It doesn't mean anything. You can't take anything with you. You're not going to show up in heaven with a truckload of money and say, hey guys, uh, here I brought some cash, upgrade my dwelling. They're going to say it ain't worth nothing up here. Well, I, I, got a, I got a whole RV full of gold. How about that? And they'll go throw it on the street. We use that for asphalt. So you can't take anything with you, but you can send it ahead. You can send it ahead, and that's what God wants you to do. God's got, here's, the, here's the thing. Check this out. Everything you got is not because you're so amazing. I know that might hurt, but I'm just being truthful. God gave it to you. Hello? And you're going to say, well, you know, I, I was eight years college. I earned this degree. I worked hard for this. Who gave you the ability to do college? Who gave you the mental capacity to retain those things? Who gave you the gifts to do what you do to make them? Who gave you the health to do it? Let's give due where due is due. It's all God's. He gave it to you. It's His. What are you going to do with it? Right? So here's the deal. He gives it to us. We take what we need. We give the rest away. He gives us more. We take what we need. We give the rest away. Hello? It's a great process. Because you know what he said? He said the love of money is the root to all evil. Oh, don't look at me like, you know, you're, I know you're all like, oh, hey, man, yeah, you're right. But you know what? We all battle that, don't we? We all battle. I wish I just had a little more. Yeah. How much do you need? Just a little more. You hear some of the richest people in the world, and you go, how much is enough? They're like, oh, just a little more. Really? Crazy. You know, we have more billionaires than we ever had before in history. You know that? Millionaires, you're nothing. When I, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, everybody wanted to be a millionaire. My dad wanted to be a millionaire by the time he was 30. Everybody wanted to be a millionaire. Now today, millionaires are nothing. That's, that's a starter home in Kilauea. <laughs> right? And you see people that got three, four hundred million, and, and, and they're like, man, we're just scraping by if I just had more. Wow. See, the love of money is the root to all evil, and, and money in the hands of a godly person can be used for God. See, because money's neutral. It's not, it's not good. It's not bad. It, it's all about who has it. And if God has blessed you abundantly, He expects more from you. But you know, the love of money, I think, is worse among the poor because we don't have it and we have a love for money. We just had the money to pay this. If we just had the money to pay that. And so it could be equally as damaging to the poor as it is to the rich. And God says, godliness with contentment is great gain. Are you content? You know what God says contentment is? Not a lot of money. He said food and clothing. I'm looking out here and everybody's dressed. Praise the Lord. And we're going to feed you after the service, so you got no excuse there. We should be happy. And if you don't think you got it good and you think you have it so bad, we can take you on a mission trip to Nicaragua, to India, to Sri Lanka, to Africa, to Philippines, to Mexico, to South America, and you will see that you are stinking rich. Because you know what you're going to do today? You're going to figure out, what do I want to eat? Not, not how do we split a cup of rice between a family of eight, but do I want tacos? Do I want pizza? Do I want sub? What do I want? And you open the refrigerator to be full, and you go, there's nothing there. Man, there's nothing to eat. You got kids, you know what I'm talking about. I just don't want a car. I want a truck. I want a Ford Raptor with all the bells and whistles. You know what I mean? That's where we're at. So we got to put ourselves in check because the love of money is the root to all evil, which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. That's what the Word of God says. Do you control your money? 
But does your money control you? Let me tell you something. Some people tip their waitress better than they tip God. Well, don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. You know, it's funny, you go to, you know, you know. remember in my day, some of you people my age, you'll get this. Remember, um, you know, tips at a restaurant, you, you gave 10%, right? You gave like 10%. That was the running thing back then, right? Now you go to the coffee shop, to a restaurant, everything's on an iPad. They spin it around, and here's what you owe, and then they list the tips, Right? There is no 10% even near there. It starts at 15 or 18%. It goes up to 25 to 30% for them handed you coffee. And you're like, whoa. But you got to hit at least 18% because everybody's watching. You don't want to look like a cheapskate. But then, you know, when God says give, we're like, whoa, I don't know. Oh, oh man. So you do the closed hand thing when the bag comes by and you got nothing in your hand. You just kind of. I'm just kidding. We've got to loosen up a little bit, all right? <sighs> so the Lord talks about false doctrines and legalisms, aggy people, stay away from argumentative people, live for God, flee from sin in this book, in, in this, this letter to Timothy. He talks to us about money. He talks to us about the things that we shouldn't do. And then in verse 11, he says, but you, O man of God, flee these things. Flee all these things he's telling us that aren't good for us that we read through the whole chapter and uh, through the whole book. And you can read all six chapters of 1 Timothy in about 10 minutes. He says, but you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life to which you are also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus who witnessed a good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus appearing till He comes, which He will manifest in his own time he who is the blessed and only potentate, that means sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor, everlasting power. Amen. <clears throat> so Paul <clears throat> hasn't ended the letter, but after saying all these things, these six chapters, he just busts out into this little praise thing about how great our God is. And he says to you and me, because we will all be challenged in our walk with God, you, you will be challenged relentlessly to sin. And you may blow it. But God loves you. You're here today, you screwed up. God loves you. Can I just tell you that? Listen. Listen. You're, you're born again. You're a child of God. You're going to heaven. You made a mistake. Just stop doing it. Let God have His way in your life. He lays down the rules, the, the, the things that He wants us to do in this book. This is the manual for life. And He says, do this and you'll prosper. Don't do this. And if we just obey Him, we're going to be successful and so here he says, these things that I've talked about, these, these negative things, these wrong things, these things of the world, this love of money, you know, all this stuff, he says, flee it. In other words, run from the world and run after Jesus. Run from the world and pursue the things that are above. But you, O oh man of God, Flee these things and pursue, here it is, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. That's a great start right there, isn't it? Man, if you loved like Jesus loved, whew. if you were patient like Jesus is patient, 
I know some of you, you guys tell me, you go, I don't pray for patience anymore because God will give me an opportunity to exercise it. Right? But when you don't have patience for somebody else, just remind yourself how patient God is with you. Hello. That'll put you right in your place. Pursue godliness. Faith. How do I get more faith? Come on, somebody knows. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. I want more faith. Read your Bible. That's it. It's an easy fix. Well, I don't understand it all. That's all right. Just digest it. Get it in there. God will just blow it up and show you all you need to know when you need to know. Just get it into your belt. Devour the Word. Increase your faith. Increase your love. Nobody loves like Jesus. How can you not love one another? Even those that have harmed you. Hello? Hello? Don't tell me, oh, you don't know my situation. I know your situation. You need to love. I didn't say you need to be a doormat for that person that's hurt you over and over. I didn't say that. But you need to forgive because it frees you up. You need to pray for them that God will get a hold of their heart. Amen? We need to love more. We need to love more. Gentleness. Woo! Yeah. Let's just move on. (laughs) Can we be a little more gentle with each other? Right? I mean, I'll tell you what. The worst is when one of us falls and you got that one person that wants to go jump on their back because they failed again. Stop it. You go to somebody the same way you'd want them to come to you. The same way Jesus comes to us with gentleness and says, I love you. Turn from that. Turn from that. I love you. And so he gives us just these good things to think about. He says, verse 12, fight the good fight. So important. Just stay in the battle because sometimes we feel like giving up. You ever felt like giving up? I'll tell you what, there's been a lot of times as a pastor I just felt like, you know, Sunday night, I quit. I'm serious. I'm just being, I'm human. You ever felt like quitting? Is it just me? Somebody say it's them too. Is it anybody anybody here? Oh, man. But you know what? There's, There's no better person to serve than the person of Jesus Christ, the Creator. And sometimes it's tough. Sometimes it seems like it's more than we can handle, but He will never give us more than we can handle, and He's always there with us. And though the enemy will whisper in your ear, you're just going to say, you know what, I'm going to fight the good fight. And though I feel like giving up, I'm not going to give up. And I'm going to keep standing strong for you. And you know what? He'll refresh you. Man, I can't tell you how many times I quit on Sunday and Monday morning. Sign back up. Got a little clarity over the night. Sleeping, woke up and said, you know what, Lord, there's nothing better than you. I'm in the game. Get in the game. God wants you there. Fight the good fight. And then he says, the, the fight of faith, lay hold of eternal life. You know, you already have eternal life. Did you know that? The day you got saved, you were already etern- in eternal life. You, it's not like something you, you, you know, I'm going to you know, live this life, and then I'll die, and then I'll obtain it. You got it now because of what Christ Jesus did. And he did that all for you. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and confess the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. There are so many people in your life that know you're a Christian. Right? Remember when you were kind of a little shy, but now you're not shy anymore? I, I just walk around town. like I've been walking around. I got this new shirt. And it's, you know what? I tell you what, this is really the way to do it. Because I don't have to talk to anybody. I just walk in and, and like I had people like I was in California and I was wearing this shirt and this guy's standing there and he looks and he stares at me and goes, I like that shirt. I'm like, yeah. And it just starts opening up conversations. I'm a Jesus freak. We, we should just print up a bunch of these and then just go walk around and, and make people uncomfortable, right? <laughs> hey, they can tell me about all their garbage. I'm going to tell them about my Savior. Because we want to see a great awakening, a move of the Spirit here on the North Shore. Amen? Amen. You are called. You have confessed a good confession before witnesses. Um, Verse, where am I at? 13, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things. 
Who gives life? Jesus Christ. He gives life to all things. He gives life to all human beings, all animals, all plants. Everything's alive. He, he supplies the air that you breathe. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus who has witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. Now you remember that? We need to be a good witness. Jesus was the ultimate example. Let me read you something uh, from John's Gospel, chapter 18. Because here it says Jesus was a good witness before Pontius Pilate. So it says there, John 18, verse 33, that Pilate entered into the praetorium again and called Jesus and he said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you concerning me? Pilate answered me, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered into the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say right. You say rightly, I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who hears of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said, what is truth? So what is truth? The Word of God. Who's the Word? Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You know, the Bible tells us that some saw Jesus, some heard Him, some looked upon Him. We didn't. But then it says some have handled him. Every time you pick this up, you're handling the Lord. He's the word of God. You need this. I can't tell you how much you need to read it. He tells us in verse 13 and 14, he says, I urge you in the sight of God who gives to all things, who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ is appearing. And so we need to keep the commandment. What's that? Being a good witness. Being a good witness. Having a good confession. Do you have a good reputation? Maybe you don't. But you can start today. You can let people see that you are changed, and I'll tell you what, that's a great testimony when people see you changed, when all of a sudden they notice they're having a conversation with you and you're not cursing. Oh, it got kind of quiet here. I know, it still slips out once in a while, doesn't it? A good confession, being a good witness, being a living testimony. I want people to look at you and say, man, he looks like Jesus. He looks like Jesus. You may be the only Bible that someone ever reads. He wants us to be without spot or blemish. He wants us to be blameless, not a liar. That's a hard one, isn't it? You ever hear people say, I don't lie? You don't? Any, you guys ever hear, you ever hear someone tell you that? I don't lie. That was a lie. You know how easy it is to lie? Walk into Foodland. How you doing? I'm doing great. How you doing? Great. I'm not doing great, but I just that's how we respond, right? That was a lie. You say, well, Steve, that's kind of like stretch. No, it's not. It's a lie. I had a hard day. I wasn't feeling great, but just so I didn't have to bring it up to them, I said great and walked down the aisle. That's how easy it is. But you know what? Here's the great thing about not lying and doing your best not to lie, then you don't have to remember who you lied to. If you just give people the truth all the time, you don't have to backpedal over anything. You don't have to like check everything and go, wow, what, was what did I say to them? What did I say to them? Because whoever you talk to, you just gave it straight. God wants us to be an example of these very things. And every believer should be awaiting His glorious appearing. Are you watching the sky? Are you ready to fly? Are you ready to get, are you ready to get out of here? I am. 
Man, I would be really cool with it happening right now. Come on. All right. Eight, nine, ten people are with me. All right. The rest of you have a vacation plan, don't you? Yeah, you just got the raise. You want to enjoy that new house you bought. You know what? Nothing down here is better than what's up there. Amen? Just let it all go. <laughs> in verse uh, 15, he says, which he will manifest in his own time, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom, he, to whom be the honor and everlasting power. Amen. That's our God. He's the only one that can give eternal life. Heaven's waiting for us. It's awesome. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. He's been doing that for uh, 6,000 years. How much better is that than the place he prepared for six days, right? Hello. It's going to be mind-blowing. He's going to be revealing his grace throughout eternity. Heaven awaits for us. Romans 8, 18 says this. Now take this to heart because I, I know some of you are going through tough times. But listen, Romans 8, 18. For, Paul says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. <laughs> Amen? Come on! You have no idea what's in store for you. I'm just going to let you in on that, all right? It's going to be good. And then he says in verse 17, he says, command those which are rich. Uh-oh. I got to say, I've been a little delinquent in this area when it comes to commanding the rich. So let's just get the offering bags out, go around again. I'm just kidding. You know, if, you, if you're wealthy, you have a great responsibility. God has given you much so you can give much. And uh, this isn't a carnal pep rally to get you to give here. But I'm saying to you, listen to the Holy Spirit when He tells you to give. He gives you so much because He wants to use you. He wants you to be a vessel of His use. It's really easy for our wealth to take control of us. It's really easy to think that we're really smart because we have a lot of money. You know, there's a lot of people that are rich that just inherited it. You know, you we watch these Hollywood actors. They do one movie. They were a nobody. They do one movie. They make millions of dollars. And now they think they're smart because they have millions of dollars. Next thing you know, they got their own TV show. And because they have millions or maybe even billions, they think that they can give everybody advice. They missed it. What God gives you, He expects you to use it. He expects you to listen, to have an ear, to hear what the Holy Spirit's saying, and to give, to invest in the things in the future, in eternity. Because he tells us there in verse 17 that riches are uncertain. He says there, he commands those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to be prideful, nor to trust in uncertain, uncertain riches, but in the living God. Uncertain riches. Psalm 52 says this, here... Here is a man who did not make God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in wickedness. You can quickly go the other direction. Proverbs eleven twenty eight: He who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like foliage. Proverbs 13, 7. There is one who makes himself rich, yet has nothing, and one who makes himself poor, yet has great riches. You're rich in Christ Jesus. Proverbs 22.4 By humility and fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Don't trust in uncertain riches. This could all be gone in a blink. That's me paraphrasing. <laughs> the first part was Proverbs. But I, I don't care how much you have. It could all go like that. Do you know the government could just seize everything right now? 
and everything you have is gone in a moment. So listen to God and send it ahead. And you, you might say, you know what, I, I've tried helping people before I got burnt. Okay, I get it. Yeah, this guy scammed me for $10,000. I thought it was a full Christian thing and all this, and he ran off and I gave the money, and then I just lost out on $10,000. No, you didn't. You had $10,000 put to your account. You did it with the right heart. You can't take anything with you, but you can send it ahead. Start sending it to head. Don't get up there and have nothing to show for her. Start sending it ahead. And not just money, your time. Time's more valuable than money, isn't it? A lot of times we'll give somebody a hundred bucks rather than our time. Everything we have can be taken in a moment, and how would you feel then? I encourage you to give like you should before that happens in this country because I think this country is going down. Send it ahead so no one can take it away. Matthew 6, verse 19 says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on this earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Right? You want to know where your heart is? Look at your checkbook and where you spend your time. True riches is in Christ Jesus who gives us richly all things to enjoy. We've got the Bible. We have fellowship. I mean, you know what's priceless? Sitting at tunnels in Hyena at the evening and watching the sun go down behind Bali High and seeing the green flash. You know what's priceless? Watching your grandkids grow up and learn. You know what's priceless? Fellowshipping with you on a Sunday morning and hearing the hoots and the shouts and the excitement during worship. The things of God. In verse 18, he says, let, let them do good. So he's warned the rich. He's warned that the love of money is the root to all evil. He's, he's commanded them not to be caught up in their riches, not to be prideful, not to trust in uncertain riches. So rich people, what should we do with our money? He says, let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. That's why I said earlier that some of us tip our waitresses better than God. Willing to share. Storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So I encourage you once again, send it ahead. So many Christians haven't gotten that yet. God gives a parable in Luke 16 of the unjust steward. And there's this guy that's an unbeliever, he's unjust, and, and he finds out from his boss he's going to lose his job. He's, he gets like a warning. I don't know, maybe it was a two-week warning. Yeah, you got two weeks left, you're gone. And so what does he do? He goes out and he goes to all of the, the debtors that owe his master money, and he goes to him and he says, hey, how, how, many, you know, how much oil do you owe? And 100 measures of oil. Oh, he goes, okay, cut it in half, mark it 50. How much wheat do you owe? Oh, 100 measures of, meat, of wheat. And he says, hey, uh, you know, cut it to 80. Take, he's going around, and he was cutting everybody's bill, what they owed his master, 20 to 50%, everybody. And the master commended him for being wise. And this is probably the most difficult parable that scholars have argued over for centuries because Jesus says in the parable, and the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Now, why would he say that? 
Because here's a guy that didn't know the Lord. He was an unjust steward. He went and basically ripped off his master because he knew he was losing his job, but he had enough sense that I got to prepare for my future. So he went around and cut everybody's bill in half so that when he was out of a job, he could go to them and say, hey, you know, remember that time I helped you out? I could use a little help right now. So he was wise to prepare for his future. And God commends him and says, you know, the unbelievers are even wiser than us when it comes to preparing for the future. Because we have a tendency when God gives us something to go, mine, not sharing, not sharing. I remember Timmy and I were at this camp meeting, and I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was Earl Hughes. He said, you know, you, you, you Christians are so tight that when the money bag goes around, when you let go of that daughter, dollar, George Washington goes, <gasps> I'm just poking fun at you. (laughs) What God is trying to avoid is a believer being rich here but having nothing to show for it in heaven. Failing to be rich in the life to come. Luke 12 says, Give alms. Provide yourself money bags which do not grow old. A treasure in heaven that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Verse 19, he talks about a good foundation. We need a good foundation. Matthew 7.24 says, Therefore, whoever hears the sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. Matthew 16.24, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, Take up his cross and follow me, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but who, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And then we finish up the chapter in verse 20. He says, Timothy, guard what is committed to your trust. And I want to say that to all of you today. Guard what's committed to you. And be obedient. Guard what is committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and the contradictions that are falsely called knowledge. Watch out for all this, these people that just consider themselves wise and they think they have all the answers through science. Forget it. The answer is Jesus Christ. So he says he warns us against the babblings and the contradictions and, and falsely called knowledge by professing it. Some have strayed concerning the faith. He says, grace be with you. Amen. So let me close with this. You control your riches. Don't let your riches control you. Send it ahead. Be a good steward. Fight the good fight because true riches are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for just reminding us this morning of how great you are and how much we need you. Lord, give us the strength to be good stewards with what you give us, Lord God. Help us not to hoard, but to give it away. Let us be a vessel that you can use. And Lord, Let us keep our eyes on you, not this world. Give us strength for today. I pray for those who may be going through something right now that you would meet them right where they're at. Empower them, strengthen them, lift them up, and remind them that you love them. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, I encourage you to just accept him into your heart right now. It's really easy just asking him to save you. Just simply say, it's, Lord, I know you died on the cross for me. You're the only one that forgives sins. Forgive me of my sins. Lord, I believe you rose from the dead. And I want to ask you into my life to be my Lord and Savior. Save me now. If you prayed that in your heart, you're, you're a child of God right now. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now go live a victorious life through the power of the Holy Spirit.